My name is Larry Sharptrand. I'm a full professor at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. I've been practicing our teaching and researching and writing on Aboriginal law issues for about uh, 30 some years now. And I've been writing critically about uh, uh, court decisions in Canada that uh, failed to live up to the expectations of um, what is an appropriate justice uh, given the colonial history uh, of Canada as against its uh, as against the indigenous peoples in Canada. Yeah, the courts have um, have been unable or or unwilling really to uh, deal with the most fundamental issue of indigenous state relations, and that is the whole question of how. Um, Canada was able to unilaterally assert its governance authority over Indigenous peoples or to unilaterally assert its ownership over its over the territory of Indigenous peoples. Uh, that, that is probably the most important fundamental issue in terms of addressing uh, human rights and, and bringing to bear justice uh, for Indigenous peoples, yet it's the one issue that the courts uh, consistently failed to examine in any serious way. Yeah, given the land back that was taken uh, without consent um, and uh, also recognizing the self-determination and self-governance authority of Indigenous peoples who were independent sovereign nations uh, prior to the arrival of uh, Europeans and um, the need to recognize um, that status is still a significant question in Canada and one that the courts have failed to um, seriously address. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the leading decisions uh, was a case called Sparrow, uh, which said that um, although Aboriginal treaty rights are recognized in the Constitution, uh, they're not absolute. And because they're not absolute, um, the government, Canadian government or provincial governments can uh, justify interfering with those constitutional rights if um, they can meet a certain legal test in doing that. Uh, so they're qualified. So the courts, in the very first decision, qualified the constitutional status of Aboriginal treaty rights. Um, that was disappointing. Um, the other thing is, in another case called Vanderpeet, um, the courts actually defined very narrowly what an Aboriginal right could be in the Constitution. Uh, it had to be something that was distinctive to the culture prior to European contact, which means, um, by definition, Indigenous peoples' rights um, are, are kind of defined very narrowly uh, to be activities, practices, and traditions. Most of the rights to date have been focused on the right to hunt for food. Um, and um, the right to hunt for food yeah, is important because it's culturally significant. It's, it's part of their traditional way of life and they want to maintain that. But um, that's a far cry from right, recognizing a right to govern your own uh, reserve territory, for example. Um, it, it's one thing to protect an Aboriginal right to hunt. It's another thing to say, okay, you, you have a constitutional right to a jurisdictional authority over how you're going to govern your community. But right now, um, this Canadian state has traditionally only recognized uh, the common law uh, and the civil law with respect to Quebec. Um, so those are two, two legal traditions, the European imposed legal traditions. Um, and uh, there has been, because of the policy of colonization assimilation, a failure to recognize the legitimacy of Indigenous legal traditions, be they the Métis, the Algonquin, the Mohawk Nation legal traditions. Uh, these, these Indigenous nations had their own legal traditions, institutions, and governance uh, authority prior to European contact. Um, one of the major issues right now is to try to see if we can 
uh, revitalize the significance of those legal traditions and have the Canadian state recognize their the authority as law, not just um, as a means to show that Indigenous peoples had a culture, but that the laws of the Algonquin are laws that can govern Canadian or Algonquin relations today in, in contemporary times, other than just the common law in Canada or civil law in, in Quebec. So it's it's trying to recognize a third order of, of, of law that exists and has always existed, but has been pushed down by Canadian colonial policy to date. It's important to understand that uh, Indigenous legal traditions have uh, certain philosophies that back them up that are distinct from the common law philosophies. Uh, uh, for example, within common law, within a liberal democratic tradition, uh, there is a significant degree of, of protection of individual autonomy and interests, uh, almost almost defined as as the main purpose of law is to protect an individual's rights to land, for example, or property. Whereas from Indigenous perspectives, um, the focus has traditionally been on relationship um, and maintaining good relationships, whether it's between other people, whether it's between the animal world, whether it's between Mother Earth, or whether it's between uh, different peoples. The emphasis is on relationship. And from and, and so the laws of the Algonquin or the laws of the Dene will reflect that kind of philosophical context. And um, because of that, uh, Indigenous legal traditions can offer a great deal to enriching law generally in Canada. Um, it, it would be um, legal, people have recognized that the concept of legal pluralism is valuable because um, you can look at different legal perspectives and how they address relationship, for example, or um, ownership, interest, and property, and see how different approaches are taken in different cultural contexts. And the system as a whole becomes richer. Well, I mean, part of it happens to be the fact that I'm Métis and, and an Aboriginal person of the Métis Nation uh, from the prairies. So I grew up um, as an Indigenous person. I've been active in the, in the Métis community in the prairies. Um, uh, and so I, it's, it's who I am. It's part of who I am. Um, I also, being out in Ottawa, um, have worked with the uh, Algonquin people in particular um, from the Kitigan Zibi community up north. Um, and I've worked with elders there. I've, I've, tried to maintain a connection um, with um, Aboriginal spirituality because um, that was the um, kind of spirituality that I was introduced uh, when I was young and uh, I was never raised Christian. Um, so I have, have that as part of who I am as well. Um, and that informs a lot of, of what I think uh, is an approach towards um, Indigenous people's um, justice. Yeah, some important steps have been taken. Um, uh, I think one of the biggest has been the recognition at the United Nations level of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Unfortunately, Canada was, was very much against that, um, voting one of four countries at the UN, UN Assembly that voted against it. Um, but since then, the Canada has agreed to sign on to it, although uh, with significant qualifications, um, which is unfortunate um, because it, uh, I mean, the UN declaration represents a minimum standard of human rights protections for Indigenous peoples. Yet, if you compare those standards with what Canada actually does, Canada fails to live up to every one of them. Um, and, and so that the recognition that that Canada can now be measured by that is important because now we can say, OK, um, this program is, is good, but it doesn't quite meet the minimum standard required under the declaration. Uh, where can we how can we work towards reconciling that that gap?
it's it's becoming um, a source for interpreting Aboriginal rights, and I hope it becomes be the dominant source. Uh, right now, um, the the court decisions and the, their jurisprudence and their their interpretation of the Constitution has been extremely narrow, extremely limiting.